All right, uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for the break and uh, being able to relax and um, just kind of recuperate a little bit. And thank you um, for giving us a great privilege of uh, being at Bryan College and studying your word studying the book of Romans. I pray that you help us today. I pray you help me as a teacher. I pray you help all of us as students uh, to think your thoughts after you. I pray as people that we would believe nothing uh, that is from man and everything that's from you. Um, we, your, your word says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And so we ask today that you would give us insight uh, into your thoughts. And I pray that you would use it um, as a means of grace in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus. Um, for we make this prayer in his name. Amen. All right, uh, please take a attendance uh, quiz 19. It's kind of amazing to think. Um, I think we only have 10 classes left counting today in this class, which is kind of amazing uh, to think about. We're going to look at Romans uh, 3 to 6 today. We're working our way through the book of Romans, and uh, we've seen that the book of Romans, even though it's only 12 pages long, if you put it in a Word document, um, I think it's only 7,000 words long, that uh, you could almost argue that the course of Western civilization was um, uh, changed by this little uh, letter that Paul wrote. That's why we're uh, spending so much uh, time on it. And I want to start off today with a question. I want you to put yourself in Paul's place. You're uh, commissioned by God to be a missionary, to bring God's uh, good news to the world. Um, you're trying to visit different places in the ancient world. Uh, to bring the good news of God's uh, salvation. And you hear tell that there's a church in Rome. And um, you're writing uh, this book, um, and you know that uh, the previous emperor, Claudius, had issued an edict that expelled all Jewish people. And um, so if you were a Jewish Christian or if you were just a Jew, you had to leave. So it'd be like New York City or something, the, the main city in the ancient world, all Jews have to leave. And that meant all Jewish Christians left. Well, eventually bad rulers... Uh, uh, die or leave office, and that's what happened to Claudius. And so once he died, uh, Jews could go back uh, to Rome, and Jewish Christians could go back to Rome. But there was a problem. The problem is when the Jews went back and the Jewish Christians went back, the Gentile Christians who had been just fine by themselves, thank you very much, now had to interact with Jewish Christians. And there was a massive racism problem in the main church at Rome. You had uh, Jewish Christians looking down on Gentile Christians as kind of sinful people. And you had... Uh, Gentile Christians looking down on Jewish Christians is weird. Like, 
man, those people talk weird, they act weird, they eat weird stuff. And so you've got a church at Rome, main city in the uh, ancient world, and you've got this racist, racism problem in that church. And you're Paul, you're an apostle, you want to do something about it. You know that a racist church is going to turn people away uh, from Christianity, and you want to bring people into Christianity. What would you do? What would you do if you were Paul? You wanted to fix a racist uh, church. You wanted to uh, help people get over this uh, natural division they had between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. How would you do it? Yeah, you uh, you would point out, hey, we've got lots of stuff in common. What else would you do? And how how would you do that? <laughs> Is that the official Greek word? <laughs> yeah. You might help both sides see that maybe they're not as inherently good as they think. That's probably what um, Paul is doing. He, he's wanting to strike at a fundamental um, belief on both sides that would help this church get over their racist views. Let me ask... Um, let me ask a question this way. If you were planting a church, you know, you want to build a mega church. Um, <clears throat> you want to have tremendous uh, impact in your mega church. Would your first sermon series be on predestination? Like, would you go to, like, the most controversial topic in salvation theology ever? Would that be, like, where you would go? Remember, this letter is 12 pages long, and, like, the middle of the letter is, like, three of the most controversial pages in Christian, in Christian theology. Does that seem strange to you? Unless maybe it's tied to what Theo suggested of helping both sides see, hey, maybe we're not, maybe we're not as inherently good as we thought. So I have another question for you. When Paul thought of his own salvation, like how Paul was saved, how did he think about his own salvation? Like how was Paul saved? Do you know the story about how Paul was saved? Like he was killing Christians, like he thought killing Christians was a great thing, and he had uh, helped when Stephen was killed, and he threw people in jail. He had them beaten so that they would renounce Christ. And he's on his way to Damascus, and God knocks him off his horse and says, you're going to be my missionary. Do you think Paul thought of his own salvation like massively on the 
free will side, you know, or do you think he thought of his own salvation as like, God just showed up and told me I was going to be his missionary. Let's look at his argument in chapter uh, 3 through 6. So what we're going to talk about is that Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians are all saved the exact same way. They're saved by grace. That's going to be Paul's argument throughout Romans. Uh, if you're a Gentile Christian, don't think you're hot stuff because... Look, you're getting promises that God had made to Jewish people. You have no inherent right to those problems. Don't think that uh, you're being saved because, like, you're better or anything. That's going to be his argument to the Gentile Christians. And to the Jewish Christians, he's going to carefully point out that, hey, the way you're reading the wrong, the Old Testament is wrong. Um, it isn't that God saved good Jewish people and then uh, is changing the world. God didn't save good Jewish people. God saved sinful people and made them good. That's going to be his argument. And his example he's going to point out an example from Abraham's life and how Abraham's life foreshadows God's uh, plans, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And Paul's ultimate argument is that that's going to result in a people that love God and who want to do things God's way. So when you're Thinking about unity, understanding that salvation is by grace is going to be a key to help people get over themselves. And that both those groups are going to end up loving God and walking with him. It's interesting to see that Paul and John are making the exact same argument. Let's look at it. Uh, 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, even as God is pure. The eventual result of salvation is going to be a people who love God and walk with God. For Jews, one of the big hang-ups that they had with Gentile people is the idea, look, these people are just outwardly living debauched lives. If they're saved, they're they're saved, but they're never going to be like decent people like us. And Paul and John are saying, no, that's not right. Everybody who's saved is going to end up being holy ultimately. Everyone's going to walk uh, with God out of love. And so Paul and John are saying, look, that's where all believers eventually end up in heaven. They love God so much that they can't sin. That's what people in heaven are going to be like. They're so uh, filled with love for God that they're beyond temptation. And so Paul's going to say to the Roman church, look, people are saved, and maybe they're saved out of a background that you didn't come from, but don't think that where somebody came from uh, naturally dictates where they end up uh, eventually. It's not true. So Paul's going to say to his Jewish brothers, don't get off that judgmental spirit. Paul says in Romans, and you start to hear how this argument 
of salvation by grace may be driving how he's trying to fix this racist church. Paul, in the very middle of the book, says those he foreknew, he predestined, he bordered off beforehand to be conformed to the image of his son. He's saying to his Jewish brethren, um, look, if somebody was a, an idolater, if someone was in massive sexual sin, if someone, you, you name it, if that person's a believer, that person's going to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So get off the, that judgmental spirit. That's not where they're going to be forever. God predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we struggle with sin, we fail, uh, we, we don't do the things we want to do and the things we don't want to do, we, those things we practice, that's what uh, Paul says as he struggles with his own uh, remnants of his fallen nature. Just as we bore the image of the man from dust, we also will bear the image of the man from heaven. That's true of every believer. Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven and we wait, await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. True of all believers, true of the most pagan, idolatrous, debauched uh, Gentile who becomes a believer, total conformity to Christ ultimately. That's the promise. Saying to his Jewish brothers, get, get over that judgmental uh, spirit. Paul's comparison is that we were all in Adam once. Uh, if we were Jews, we were in Adam, um, and no one is inherently righteous, not even one person. Moses wasn't righteous. Abraham wasn't righteous. Daniel wasn't righteous. None are righteous inherently, not one. And the wickedness with which we're all plagued is beyond all imagination. Uh, that's true of Jewish, inherently uh, Jewish uh, Christians. It's true inherently of Gentile Christians. But if a person's a believer, they're in Christ. They're not in Adam. As God interacts with them, he's not interacting with them in Adam anymore. He's interacting with them in Christ. And every single person will be transformed. Uh, the day is going to come, you know, if, if you have a sweet mate or something and that person's a little selfish and can get on your last nerve at times, you know, if that person's a believer, the day's going to come when that person's going to be the nicest person to be around you've ever met. Um, the day will come when that person is completely transformed. That's true of Jewish Christians. It's true of Gentile Christians. We have a hope in the glory of God that in Adam... The wickedness is beyond all imagination, but in Christ there's a, a hope, a beyond hope in the glory of God. And so Paul's kind of making that argument. And Paul believed that if the church at Rome could get their minds around that truth, being saved by grace, saved to a total transformation, if they could get their mind around that truth, the result would be a radical unity for all those who are in Christ. That's how he's trying to fix the problem 
in the church at Rome. So he starts off with his Jewish um, Christian uh, friends. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? And he says, no, we're not any inherent better off. We've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. If 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 there's ever an embracing, a healthy embracing of good Christian um, theology, the result should be humility. Have you ever been around a Christian and like the two of you walk in a gymnasium and you feel like there isn't room in that gymnasium for both your egos? Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> like, is that how Christian theology should work or should it be where we say with the people of old, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory. Um, I remember one time I uh, was working um, just in the service department at a mega church, and uh, I was, uh, I think I had just gotten out of graduate school or I was getting out of graduate school, and um, it was interesting being at this mega church. And I'll never forget the feeling of appreciation I had when a, uh, there was a, a, a major Christian artist uh, came to the mega church to do a concert. And um, my friend happened to be in the elevator with him, so it was like a, um, you know, ma major Christian uh, artist, and he's there. And, and my friend said to him, uh, so you're the, you're the man. And the Christian artist said, uh, no, Jesus is the man. I'm just here to worship Jesus. Isn't there something right about that in terms of, like, Christian theology? Um, that the ultimate story isn't about me or about you. The ultimate story is about Jesus. Paul's making that point. Are we any better off? Not at all. We're all under sin. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Is Mother Teresa inherently good? No. Uh, was Billy Graham inherently good? No. If you've ever seen the funny video on YouTube, uh, John Piper is bad. Has anybody ever seen that video? You know, Michael, do you know who Michael Jackson was, the singer? You know, he has a song called Bad. Well, there's a video of John Piper preaching to that video and uh, somebody asked uh, him about it and he laughed and he said uh, I have no idea who made it but it's absolutely true uh, that we're all uh, bad that we're all uh, you know if left to ourselves we would um, pursue evil in many uh, ways Paul's making that point there's no one who's inherently good We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable to God. 
what Paul seems to be arguing, or at least to me he seems to be arguing, is that as a Christian, and he's talking to ethnic groups here, uh, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, that understanding that salvation is by grace is going to help you be a humble person toward other people. That understanding kind of your own sin, your own problems, that that's going to go a long way in making you a more gentle person, a more humble person, a more loving person. No one is inherently righteous apart from Christ. That's going to be his argument. Therefore, saved people are saved by grace alone without a view to anything inherent in themselves. That's the point he's trying to make. Uh, so, some people have uh, turned this total depravity that um, the seeds of wickedness are so great in all of us at conception that if God just left us alone, removed us from uh, common grace, removed us from uh, particular grace, if God just left us alone, there would be no limit to the evil that we would do. Look at what Paul says. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There isn't any kind of ethnic superiority uh, in salvation. For all who believe, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Uh, understanding that your salvation uh, has much more to do with God's gift to you rather than anything inherent in you. What becomes of our boasting if that's true? It's completely excluded. A, a person who understands Paul's, um, Paul's teaching here is never going to be the kind of person who boasts about themselves. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory. This story isn't about me. This story is about God. That's the attitude of all people in heaven. God is saving all people the exact same way, by grace. There are only two groups of people. Those who by their willful rebellion and sin deserve punishment of hell, and those who by God's grace undeservedly enjoy the grace of heaven. There is no third group of people who are uh, more savable than other, or people who are more prone toward religion than others. It's just people who are saved by grace. We hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he says, or, or maybe you think God's only the God of the Jews. Isn't he the God of the Gentiles too? Of course. Since God is one who will justify circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. When the Jewish Christians came back to Rome and they were judging their uh, Gentile brothers and looking down, he's saying that is wrong. And it's wrong because you believe that there's something inherent in you that... Uh, is the reason why you're saved. 
And I just asked the question, do you ever struggle with that idea yourself that, like, if you're a believer, do you ever struggle with the idea, hey, maybe I'm a believer because I'm just smarter than other people? Or maybe I'm a believer because they couldn't put together the promises, but I could? Maybe there's something inherently in me that's a little more savable than other people. Do you ever struggle with that idea? Paul's saying it's not true. It isn't about anything inherently in you. It's about God's grace. Paul says, okay, I want you to imagine that you're Paul preaching uh, in a synagogue somewhere. And you preach, you preach your heart out and you say, people are saved by Jesus' work alone. Um, it's nothing to do with the person. It's nothing to do with inherent ability. Salvation with God is by Jesus' work alone. It's by grace. If you believe, God will give you Jesus' righteousness and forgive all your sins. Imagine you're Paul and you preach that. What do you imagine someone would say to you? Uh, so, or... Or imagine we did it this way. Um, uh, imagine you had a class and the teacher said, okay, um, there are no grades in this class. I want you to imagine this with me, okay? There are no grades in this class. There are uh, no attendance grades. Um, I'm, I'm not going to keep track of whether you do the homework or not. Um, uh, you don't have to come to class. And at the end of the class, um, I'm going to let you fill in what you should make for this class. Do you know that like 95% of that is exactly true of the British educational system? Did you know that? Like in Britain, um, did you know in Britain you don't have to go to class? Did, did you know in Britain that there are no tests at all uh, during the year ever? Um, did you know that? There's only one test at the end of the year. You flunk that, you get kicked out of school, and you can never reapply ever for any uh, call. So there is that. But um, in terms of going to class, quizzes, there are in the British system. Uh, there are no, when I was over there, before that last quiz, you know, uh, like the beginning of the year, like it would be me, a postgraduate student, one other postgraduate student, and maybe one undergraduate student, you know. Two weeks before that test, people be living in the library, like you'd see people that hadn't taken a shower in two weeks and like they're hair's just frizzed and like they're living on Mountain Dew, you know, walking around trying to memorize these tests. And then they would take it. People would get kicked out. The ones who pass, they pay to stay for the next year. Uh, sorry. It's just a funny example. But imagine we were doing that here. But instead of that final test, um, I was just going to pass out a, a piece of paper and on the piece of paper, it's going to have your name and then a place for the grade. And whatever grade you put on that piece of paper is going to be the grade I turn in for the class. So how many of you would uh, vote that no one would do anything in the class ever? Be honest. Be honest. Okay, would you come to class every day if that were the system? Because there's no penalty, 
right. Paul got that same thing when he preached grace. Paul, if what you're saying is true, people are going to live a debauched life. Paul, if what you're saying is true, um, people are just going to fall in love with sin. And Paul says, no. Understanding God's grace ultimately is going to produce people who obey the law. It's, it's funny, in Greek, in my Greek class year, years ago, I would do this. Uh, um, I would wait, you know, uh, Greek is hard. Um, has anybody ever taken a hard class, like a class you had to study hours for every day? Anybody ever take a class? Okay, so that's Greek, right? You don't do that, you're going to fail. But uh, Greek is the hardest class you'll ever love. That's what my professor told me 40 years ago. I'm still in love with it to, today. Love when I can do it. Um, Imagine like a class where there wasn't a great, and in Greek class I would do this, I would wait till the class was kind of tired, and then I would um, pass the test out, and I would say, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. Uh, you guys can pick one person to take the test, and whatever they get, I'll give the whole class. And so year after year, the class, and some of those classes would be big, you know. They would pick, you know, the, the guy who sat on the front row who just, you know, or the girl who was the, the best one. Year after year, they would do that. And you know what always seemed odd to me? Because I would always say it this way. You pick whoever take this class, whatever they get on the test, I'll... Um, I'll give the whole class. You know who they never asked to take the test? Me. But that was the offer. Pick anybody in this room. And finally, one student realized, hey, would you take the test? I said, sure. And I got an A. I don't know how that happened. I got an A on the test. What if Christianity is exactly that? Saying, okay, to live at peace with God, you've got to live a perfect life. Okay. Okay, here's the deal. You pick one person. They get to play for the side. Whatever they get, that's your grade. Okay? Jesus is going to take the test. Great. Okay, but... Wouldn't that produce people who didn't study for the class? What if you could come up with a way where it was by grace? Okay, you're going to count Jesus' test as our test. But it also came up with a way where it made us want to study. That's what Paul's arguing for here. You are saved totally by Jesus' life. When, you know, you ever do this? You want God to answer a prayer uh, that you have, and, uh, you know, you really want God to answer that prayer, and so what do you say to yourself? Well, I'm going to have a quiet time every single day this weekend. You know, it's not going to be that, you know, two and a half minute thing like it's going to be a real quiet time I'm mean, because I'm going to kind of do good stuff and then at the end of the good stuff I'm going to ask God for something he'll give it to me because I've done good stuff and what if Paul's saying 
Yeah, that's not it. What if Paul's saying understanding God's grace actually is going to produce people who want to be in class? Imagine our little example of uh, you know getting a sheet of paper at the end, and like I say to you, put the um, uh, grade you think you deserve on it. So, okay. In that same analogy, imagine then that I felt like it was my responsibility to help you become the best student you could um, be. Like, what what would I do? Uh, like in that scenario, knowing there's going to be no quizzes, no, knowing that you're going to be the one that fills out um, what you get and that whatever grade on that paper is, that's what I'm going to turn in. But I want you to become the best student you can. What What do you think I would have to do as a teacher? What's that? incentivize work differently, how could I do it? Suppose I was like Elon Musk or something, and so I want to incentivize you becoming the best student you could. How, how could I do it? Having rewards. So I say, okay, you don't have to come to class, but if you do come to class, I'll give you $1,000 every time you come to class. Do you think people be transferring into the class? Okay. Uh, suppose I said every day we'll have a um, pop quiz in the middle of the class. I'll give you $1,000 for being here. And if you get the answer right on the quiz, I'll give you $1,000 if you get it right. W would you study hard? Um, suppose I said, okay, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to come to class, you fill out your own grade. Um, but if I talk to you and you do well, um, at the end of class, I'll give you a job. Um, and, you know, we'll start you out at $100,000 a year. So it sounds like all I need is lots of money to incentivize you to be better students, right? Or suppose it wasn't money. Suppose uh, like I was um, like some relationship guru and uh, said, okay, if you come to class and, and pay attention, I'll give you the three keys that will... Uh, transform any relationship you ever have. W would you come to class? What if that's what Paul's getting at? He's saying it isn't penalty that motivates people. It's promise. It's, um, it's going to give you... Uh, something. Uh, I wonder, um, I wonder if that isn't the argument he's making, that yes, salvation is by grace. God is absolutely forgiving your sins and counting Christ's righteousness is totally yours. But God's come up with a way to do that and also make you a person who wants to do the right thing. That would be a pretty clever story. I think that's what Paul is arguing uh, here. And, and I will say in the British system, it's terrifying because like in PhD studies, that thing of the test every year, you don't have that. You just have one test at the end, and if you fail, you don't get anything, and if you pass, you get a degree. And, uh, oh my goodness, you walk into that test, it's an oral test where they ask you questions. You've written a book, and they ask you questions, and 
if you pass, you get a degree, and if you don't pass, you get any, you don't get anything. And uh, th that is like absolutely terrifying. You walk into that. Um, but if you were a lazy person for four years, you could just go and do nothing. Uh, but anyway, I like a mixture of hours. I, I don't know how you do uh, classes without tests and without uh, grades uh, like that. So, uh, Paul is making this argument, Jews aren't any better, and he's preached this sermon enough to know that there's going to be an ex uh, objection. Well, Paul, what about Abraham? Abraham was justified by works. I mean, James says Abraham was justified by works. All Jews believe Abraham was justified by works. Paul, how does what you're saying square with that? Doesn't his life show that he was a righteous man? And Paul's going to say, yes, his life shows that he was a righteous man. But he wasn't saved because he was a righteous man. He was saved by grace. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, and the way this is written in Greek, and some people argue against this, but it's absolutely true. In Greek, it's assuming that this part of the sentence is true. There's a way in Greek to write it where it's not true. This is written in a way... It's called a first-class condition. Uh, it's assuming that that statement is true somehow. This is why Paul isn't um, uh, disagreeing with uh, James. He's admitting that there's, there's a way you can say that Abraham was justified by works, but it's not the way you think. Uh, he's not justified with God by his works. He's justified... Uh, before men, um, he's justified by God, by grace. Let's see what he says. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But then Paul says, but he doesn't have something to boast about with God because in terms of inherent and... Uh, being justified apart from Jesus, he wasn't justified uh, by his life. He was justified by grace. And here's par Paul's argument. At least I think it's Paul's argument. Do you realize in the Old Testament that three figures uh, dominate the first 3,000 years of uh, history? Abraham, or Adam, basically um, is the main figure for the first thousand years. Noah is the figure for the second thousand years. And Abraham is going to be the figure for the third thousand years. And this is if you just go through and add the numbers up. What do you notice about Abraham's life? in the end of Noah's life? What do you notice? Yeah, so he dies, and then like two years later, Abraham's born. Isn't that funny how none of us like add the numbers up? The numbers are given and we just like skip over it. Maybe the numbers mean something. So did God save Abraham because he was a righteous man? So when God uh, met Abraham right here, was he saving someone who was a righteous man? No. What can you tell me about Abraham at 70 years old?
Yeah, so Sarah is his half-sister, same father, different mother, and they're married, right? Are they worshipers of God at this point, or are they worship idols? They're part of a fertility cult. In fact, all their names are connected to pagan fertility cult. Um, when God interacted with Abraham and he went here, did Abraham live a perfectly righteous life? He's got a problem here. He's got a problem here. He wasn't a perfect person in terms of his flesh. His flesh had the same problems that our flesh has. Does Abraham do some pretty stunningly righteous things? Yes. He follows God here. He believes God here. He massively agree, believes God's here, and he's faithful to God when he dies. Paul's argument is Abraham's a picture of all of us. We have, when we're converted, we have at the core of who we are a righteous thing given to us by God. We still have the problem with the flesh, but we have at the core of who we are something that's glorious and good. And our life is going to be like Abraham. There are going to be highs and lows. There's going to be triumphs and tragedies. But this is the way God works with saved people. And eventually, in heaven, God can say of Abraham that the whole cosmos didn't match the worth of this person. Paul is saying this is a picture of all of our salvation. We're not perfect. We've got problems. God isn't saving us because we're good, but God ultimately is going to make us men and women of whom the very cosmos isn't worthy. That's Paul's argument. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one person. In Hebrew, uh, this phrase, look down on the sons of man, in the Hebrew it says, look down on the sons of Adam. There's no one who's a son of Adam that God can say this person is inherently good. Not Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham, not John Piper, not you, not me, not anyone. There's no one who's inherently good. But people find grace in God's eyes, and the result is they're righteous people. God turns them into righteous people. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the toledot of that. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. We believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way that they were saved. That's Paul's argument. That's how Paul's saying uh, this group of Jewish believers and Gentile uh, believers, that's how they'll be one. And if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Yes, Abraham's works show that he was a righteous man. 
James says that. Paul believed it. But is he saved because of that? And James and Paul are going to say no. He's saved by grace. The key to understanding Abraham's life is God's grace. God did not choose Abraham because he was good. Rather, God chose Abraham and made him good in Jesus by giving him a new heart. Ultimately, it was Jesus' heart. That's what Paul is helping his Jewish brothers understand and you might think of Abraham's life he's in Ur of the Chaldees and in Hebrew Ur is the city of lights the enlightened city he's living a pagan life and God shows up and says okay I want you to go here leave your family uh, go here to land I'll show you and Abraham goes here He doesn't leave his family. In fact, it's his father who takes him. And they stay here for many years. After his father dies, he says, go to the land. And he goes. He's not perfect. He still sins. And God's counting him as being righteous. This is the picture of all of our lives. We're all saved this exact same way. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number. For you were fewest of all people. The reason that he chose you is because he loved you. And he was keeping an oath that he swore to your forefathers. Paul says this, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who according to his great mercy, his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. That's what the life of Abraham is showing us. Salvation by grace. You might say, well, wasn't it Abraham's fate that made him different? Like other people didn't believe, but Abraham had faith. Wasn't wasn't the faith what made him different? Well, his faith did make him different. But I want you to look at something with me in the text. And you tell me what you find interesting about this. So the text says the fruit of the Spirit, the one fruit of the Spirit, is agape, joy, peace, being patient with people when they're mean to you, being good to people when they're not good to you, Uh, just goodness, complete goodness. But then it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, right? Anybody in here taken Greek? Sometimes there are. Um, So this word is used hundreds of times in the New Testament. And nearly every time it's translated faith. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. So here's the question. Does faith come from us or does it come from God? Or is it God through us? Jesus said, either make the 
tree good and its fruit will be good, or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for by the tree is known its fruit. So the question is, does faith come from us apart from God's work, or is faith part of God's working in us? If, to use our imperfect analogy about the class where you determine your own grade, um, like incentivizing belief, is it something we produce on our own or is it something that God works in us? In, In my analogy, a really good teacher, if that teacher were persuasive enough could perhaps come up with the um, emotional arguments and intellectual arguments to actually talk you in to come to class without a grade. That would be a really good teacher, wouldn't it? Like if a person could convince you to do something without bribing you to do it, right? That would be a really good teacher. I don't know, if C.S. Lewis were your teacher, would you come to class? That would be a great, that would be a great setup, wouldn't it, where a a teacher worked to so incentivize you becoming a better um, student that you actually became a better student. Paul says this, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. So there's a question that people have here. And this, what is the antecedent of this? An antecedent is when you have the word this, what does this point back to in that sense? By grace are you saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is uh, God's gift. In fact, uh, uh, Theo, I don't know if you, you know this, but your name actually comes from these two words gift of God like that's the exact I don't know if you knew that uh, the gift of God so what what's the this is it all of this If the this is all of this, where does faith from God come from? Faith is a gift. Abraham and his family had problems. If you take time to um, add up all these numbers, um, you get nice, beautiful charts. This is the ultimate beautiful chart that you get. You just add the numbers up. This is Abraham's life. This is when he's born. What do you notice about Abraham's life and Shem's life? That is, somebody who had gone, who was on the ark, who experienced God's judgment and was saved. What's true chrono- chronologically about Shem and Abraham? They're alive at the same time. If Abraham was an idolater, he was an idolater while there was a living voice saying, don't sin against God, follow God. 
the story of Abraham is not God saving someone who was inherently good. The story of Abraham is God saving someone by grace and then turning him into a person of whom the whole universe wasn't worthy of that person. That's exactly what the New Testament is going to say. Consider your calling, brothers, that we were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. God has chosen the base things of the world and the despised things God has chosen the things that are are not so that he might nullify the things that are. God is in the habit of picking unlikely people to do extraordinary things. And Paul knew that that kind of message um, it's good news for anybody. No, nobody can say, oh, I'm just too bad. Oh, my family is just too bad. God could never use someone like me. And it's like, no, God delights to do that. God delights to save people out of sin and save them into uh, righteousness and transformation and I think that's Paul's argument. So what I want you to do, if you're able to work through the homework, take that idea and see if that works in Romans. And we're going to keep working through the chapters. Eventually we're going to get to Romans 9, the that theologically hard chapter, and we're going to talk about different ways uh, to look at it. But Work through and see if that isn't Paul's argument. And I'll see you on Thursday.